So it's the middle of the afternoon in December, which means the sun is long since set, and it's time for the speed skating video podcast. So today is a special day because we have our first true short track uh, racer on the channel. We have not had a a true short tracker at this point. Um, uh, she was a dual medalist in the 2010 games and finished second overall in the 2011 World Championships. But a whole lot of things happened to her along the way in her career, and here to tell us all about it is Catherine Adamick. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me today. Very happy and very excited to have this one. I've, I've been looking forward to it um, for quite a while. We we decided to do this, but it, you know, it always takes a while to get things on the calendar. So I'm, I'm very excited to have you here. Um, so usually what happens is we end up talking about history, um, you know, getting started in the sport and all that. And, and I think that's important with this one, but I think it's even more important because I, I think when I studied your career, you know, it's a summation of things that have happened to you over the course of years in sport that have, you know, laid the groundwork for what you're doing as a career and, and just as uh, how you've turned out as a person. Um, so looking back at the very, very beginning, you know, you getting on skates at a very young age, you didn't start off as a speed skater. You started off as somebody that was on skates. Um, but it didn't take you terribly long to decide that going fast was a big thing and that uh, wandering in the short track arena was, was something that you wanted to do. So kind of tell us, tell us how that all got started. Sure. Um, that's a great way that you put it, that I, I just grew up on skates. I, I don't remember when I learned how to skate. I have a picture of me as like a two or a three-year-old. Uh, I had these quad in line, not in lines, but like quad roller skates that you can Velcro on the outside of a little kid's <laughs> shoe. And the wheels didn't actually turn. I oh. mean, I, but I could walk around in them. I could scoot and I could march. So, I mean, like I said, I can't even remember the day that I put skates on for the first time. And a little older than that, four or five, I started figure skating with my mom. And I did, I did enjoy that, but I just wanted to race all the time. So there wasn't a lot of room for me. <laughs> so my parents met a few other parents at the rink who said, you know, you should really bring her to a speed skating practice. And I remember the first day I was still wearing my, my figure skating outfit, which was hot pink tights and a pink tutu. Awesome. I'll never forget that outfit. It's great. Um, didn't take me very long. I traded out the pink leggings and tutu for a hot pink skin suit. And I was racing that year. I don't remember if I was a first year or a second year tiny tot, but I was about as young as you could be and still race. Hmm. And, um, you know, I remember by the time I was about eight years old that I was, I was skating with the adults in my group. And that, the longer I skated, the more it just kind of dawned on my family and I like, wow, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> and I did enjoy it. I had a lot of fun. Um, but I was also just someone really lucky. I found something I was good at. It wasn't just um, a passion for me. It was also something that, you know, God gave me a gift and they, he gifted my parents with um, the opportunity to expose me to skating from a young age. And there's a lot of things that I could not, I could not recreate. They just happened that way. Um, and here we are now. <laughs> Yeah, you skipped a lot of stuff in between, but um, so yeah, so you you start doing short track competitions, um, and you said that took you to about the age of eight. Um, when did you when did you start getting uh, I guess what I would call serious coaching? Well, I took a few years off from ice skating. Um, I would say from about ten to thirteen. And I embraced the inline speed skating culture during oh. that time. And I would say that's when it became like a project of love because I would go to the rink Friday and Saturday nights, sometimes on Wednesdays. And I'd wear my quads and I'd skate around with my friends and listen to music. So I just loved being at the rink. And then I'd be back at the rink 
probably two more days a week for actual speed skating practice. And then on the weekends, my dad and I would go out in my roller skates, or as I got older, uh, he would be on his road bike and I would be in my inlines and we would bike or skate together. And he enjoyed being a part of the local cycling group. So eventually, like when I'm about age 12, um, I'm cycling with adults, I'm skating in a pack or a pace line behind cycling adults. And when I was 12 is the age when I went to my very first nationals. And um, in inline, I don't know if they have this anymore, but they used to have a subdivision called JO, which is like if you have open A in ice speed skating and then you have like just, I guess, your open section. JO is basically open. So I made it into the finals uh, at my first nationals. And yeah, that's when I remember telling my parents, like, I want to be a professional athlete when I grow up. Hmm. And so we probably started pursuing elite level coaching when I was about 15. We could do it by ourselves for a few years. Uh, but eventually it got to the point where, you know, my dad's a very athletic person, but he doesn't speed skate. So I needed to find coaches who had um, more technical knowledge. And I started working with Adam Reedy, who was a coach from Ohio. And he changed my life. He and Trisha Stennis are the two people who very much took an interest in me and stood up for me and had my back when I was just an awkward teenager. And I did not look good when I skated at all. Um, but they thought I was strong and saw I was motivated and they, they had my back and helped me get into the Olympic training program at Marquette, Michigan. That was back in 2007. Is that right? No, I went there in 2005 and okay. then I moved to Utah in 2007 when I made yep. the national team. Yeah. So the Marquette thing was a, like a junior development program. We were, yes, we were considered the education center. And so you didn't have to be a junior to train there, but you were supposed to be taking classes at Northern Michigan University. Oh, okay. Um, you were considered the Olympic education center where you're training to hopefully be on an Olympic team, but you're still at an age and an ability level where it's appropriate to go to school. I think one of the first things that happened to you that was, was impactful um, is that move to Michigan, you know, in 2005. So at that point, you're, how old are you? Like 15? 16. 16 years old. Yeah. So you're, <laughs> you, you left home at 16. So not everybody yeah. does that. I mean, most of the people that are, you know, a, elite athletes at that age, maybe are doing a lot of stuff, but they're sleeping in their own bed every night. So how, how did yeah. that impact you? Well, I'd like to make a disclaimer. Um, I thoroughly do not recommend doing that. I okay. <laughs> will I will give in to the fact that if I hadn't done that, I would not have been a strong competitor. The year that I went to Marquette was an Olympic year. And so I got to train with athletes that were Olympic caliber. Kimberly Derrick was becoming well-known on the World Cup circuit at that point. Um, my first year skating, I trained with Anthony Labello and Travis Jayner and also Amy Peterson. She made a comeback for the 2006 Olympics and she did not make the team, but she was my teammate and I stuck to her like glue and I never would have learned the things that I needed to learn if I didn't get to copy athletes that were so much farther ahead of me on the path. So when they were gone the next year, I still... I knew what it was like to train like an Olympian, like it was an Olympic year. And that experience made me the athlete that I was. That being said, you know, if there's anyone listening now and they're thinking about it, stay home, okay? <laughs> it's too young. It's too young. Yeah. You wanna learn how to train like an Olympian? Call me, shoot me an email, find yourself a good coach in your area. You do not need to give up your life, your family, your home, your friends, your hobbies. You don't need to do it that young. And I would actually say now being 34, um, there's only one or two more years when you're 16, only one or two more years where you get to be home and enjoy that time of your life. And um, I would just highly encourage athletes, you know, you don't have to pick up and move away from home to continue working on yourself and to continue to improve. 
you participated in 2006 uh, uh, trials? I did. Got last yeah. place. Okay. And I'm assuming that, you know, your expectations going in were just, to, okay, I got to go get some experience and see what this is like. Well, my family had some pretty high expectations at that point. I mean, I went, I, I went to Marquette on an Olympic year not to get last place. <laughs> Definitely didn't make that huge sacrifice in my life to get last place. Um, I wasn't even close. That was a, that was a learning opportunity, I guess. Uh, I'd been really strong at the beginning of the season. I think I was 10th or 11th at American Cup 1. And so I was very much expecting to be in the top 16 at trials. Um, and so to not even be in the, the top 16, that was a big disappointment. Hmm. Okay. But in spite of that, it wasn't long after that that you were suddenly on the U.S. national team and moving to Salt Lake. Correct. So how did that happen? Yeah. How did how did you go from uh, last place to being selected to go to Salt Lake City? Well, the next year, so the 2006-2007 season, first year of the quad, which means everyone's retiring and it's time for the next generation to move up. So I made my first set of World Cup teams that season, that second season that I was in Marquette. Um, and I'll be honest, the thing that flipped the switch for me, and I again, disclaimer, not saying this was healthy, I got a chance to go to the, um, what is it, FISU games, where again, it's, it's specifically for athletes who are in school, but it's a world-class event, and the FISU games are like, they're like an Olympic games for for student athletes. Okay. So I went to that competition and I had had enough recovery time leading up to it that for the first time in at least two seasons, I was actually rested. I could actually give my best. And it was really a perfect storm of things. I got into like this little tiff with my teammates and I kind of isolated myself and just really focused on my racing. I focused on my diet, my, my recovery. And I kind of found that that was a perfect storm. Hmm. Being rested, being focused. Uh, I, I got into a couple top 10 finishes. And then when I got back, I rode that momentum into our nationals. And I did not know I made I made that team. I made the team that year. I made the senior world championship team just as a relay spot, just as an alternate. And that qualified me to go to Salt Lake. And so, yeah, it is kind of funny how I didn't feel as though I was very successful in Marquette. I achieved a few goals, but overall, that was not a successful time for me. Um, but I had a few perfect storms, right? Like training with... Um, training with Amy Peterson, having the support of a few coaches who saw my worth. And, you know, it's not really a gift to be isolated from your teammates when you're traveling in Europe. That's no fun. And yeah. yet that isolation is what helped me double down and get more focused. And that ultimately led to more success. So when you showed up in Salt Lake, did it feel different than when you showed up in Michigan? Yes. When I showed up in Michigan, I was just a little kid. And maybe you, uh, maybe you've seen this, how little kids show up to the rink with their skin suit on, you know, that feeling I showed yeah. up to my first day at the U S Olympic education center with my skin suit on. Cause that's what you did. That's how you go to, that's how you go to the rink. <laughs> and, and I was just a kid, right? Everyone's like, what are you doing? We're not on the ice for an hour. Go put on your sweatpants. We have warm up. We have a workout. Yeah. So that was just in way over my head. When I went to Salt Lake, I moved out with a few teammates who I knew from Marquette, so I wasn't a complete newbie. But I did have pretty big shoes to fill. My coaches, my new coaches, did expect a lot from me, and they were very disheartened to find that um, I competed better than I trained. But that was uh, that was the first step. So I remember having a conversation with Jay Su Chun, who was the head coach at the time, and. And I said, you know, I'll, I will train pretty much as hard as you ask me to with a great attitude, uh, as long as you watch out for me. 
I was coming from a situation in Marquette where my coach did not watch out for me. My coach very purposefully trained me into the ground and just watched, just stepped back and watched. Um, and so when I was working with this new coach, I was very clear, I'm a hard worker, I'm a good athlete, I try to keep a good attitude, but I expect this to be a two-way street. I will not train myself into the ground so that you can just see which athlete survives your training program. If I'm gonna work this hard, it's because you're gonna have my back and you're gonna help me improve. And he was so open to that. He was very much like, you're gonna work hard with a good attitude. All I have to do is my job. What's expected <laughs> of me as a coach, great. You know, that, and like that, awesome. that was the beginning of a great relationship for a, for a few years at least. I am super happy that that story ended that way because I really thought it was going to be another lead up to some, you know, total disappointment. So that's uh, no, <laughs> that was no, a I, well, I got good. I got good when I moved to Salt Lake. I yeah, was, I had no not question. been strong. Huh? No, I said, there's no question. I mean, you're, you know, like 2009 um, seemed like a year where just there was a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was, I actually think it was the 07 season was my best season. I won every distance at US Championships, um, set all kinds of American records that year. I did a 128.2 time trial for the 1000 meter. Um, at that point, girls didn't go under 130. I'm sure other girls were doing it at their home ranks, but in general, especially on the World Cup circuit, no one was breaking 130. So that was my best year by far. Um, and I had several years where I worked, I worked beautifully with Jesu because I had not been a strong trainer before. Uh, I had just been a strong competitor and his training program and my commitment level to it. I think that was, I, I will say on my own behalf that it was my commitment level to it that really made it work because I, there is one workout that I shortchanged in my entire time in Salt Lake City. And um, it wasn't for lack of trying, it was just for complete exhaustion. There was yeah. nothing left. And I have a lot of pride at this point in my life to look back and say, there was no stone left unturned, not one, not ever. I did every single thing that I could. Hmm. So those were, I mean, that, that quad leading up to the 2010 games, um, clearly it started off great. Um, what would you say like seven, eight, nine leading into 10? Was it pretty just, you know, building and building and everything was positive or, you know, certainly we'll get to this, but, uh, you know, injuries played a huge role in, in your sporting life. Um, did you maintain pretty good health and were you solid during those years? Well, I, so I peaked in 07, 08 that season. And then I, I was still good in the United States in 08 and 09, but I was not as good internationally as I had been the year before. And that was just a case of the sophomore slumps. Like I had this fear that I'd had such a great initial senior team season that I had this fear of like, what if I'm just a fluke? And, um, it was all mental for me. My physical was just as good as it ever was, but the doubt, the doubt really consumed my thoughts and it showed, it showed in my racing. And it wasn't until probably February of that, of that next season that I started to get some confidence back. Um, and then my, so then my third year would have been the 09, 10 season. And yeah, that was, that was my Olympic year, which, I wouldn't say is my strongest year. I mean, I would say 07, 08 was my strongest year. Hmm. Um, 09 and 10 is when I first got hurt. And um, that was very disheartening because it was at a, actually a World Cup in Marquette where I had, I had finished in the top five in every distance. And the Olympics are like two or three months away. And then I fell in the relay and I hurt my hip. And, um, that was the beginning of the end. You know, I hadn't, I had trained hard enough and long enough that I was still able to perform for seasons past that point. But my ability, my body's ability to regulate was finished in December of 2009. Hmm. What, what kind of injury was it? 
I tore a labrum. Oh. Okay, yep. so... So... Like a twisty impact kind of thing that resulted in a, in a muscle tear? No, I hit the boards with my back, and the way that I hit, my femur was at a 90-degree angle to the boards. So basically... Um, all of that speed, all of that momentum really got absorbed in my right hip. And it yeah, was my okay. right femur jamming up and in to my gotcha. right hip. Okay. We didn't know the extent of it at the time, but what from what I've learned now, um, that basically jammed my SI joints, which is like the right underneath your lumbar spine. So the yeah. lowest part of yeah. your back, it's where you're it's where your hips start and then below your SI joint is your tailbone. Yep. So if you can imagine, all right, I'll, sh I'll show you a picture here. Like your sacrum sits like this and then your tailbone comes down here and then you've got a space here for your hip and your femur. Does that all yeah. make sense? Yep. So when my femur got jammed in, everything got jammed in and up. I lost the mobility from my right hip, which means that I actually gained some mobility in my left hip. And when I say that I could never self-regulate again, um, it was 2016 before I was able to get my leg length to be the same again. And so this is a really common for speed skaters. If you ever get that really tight, pinchy feeling, like right where your spine meets the top of your pelvis, those two little divots there, those dimples in your low back, that's where your SI joint is. And that's where speed skaters hurt all the time. And I found a really great trick that sometimes what that means is that your leg length is off. And it's usually the left leg that's the short leg for speed skaters because we're always turning left. So a normal human body can go see the trainer or the chiropractor and they, they shift that right back into place. But my hips just stopped being able to do that. And like I said, it wasn't until 2016 and I had taken four years off at that point too, where my body could actually start to heal. Good Lord. Ooh. So that was the, that was an Olympic year. That was Olympic year. Yeah. And I, so after the Olympics were over, I got a, uh, I remember talking with my athletic trainer and it was like, the d races are done. And he's like, Hey, Catherine, just so you know, when we get home, you need to get imaging on that hip because they didn't want it messing with your Olympics. You weren't going to make it worse, but we can't go another four years like that. So to find out, you know, a few months later, and thank God he didn't tell me because I would have been a basket case. Yeah. I was already like completely taped up and not my best self in Vancouver. So if he had layered on that sense of doubt, like, oh God, something might be wrong, um, mm. I wouldn't have handled it well. So I'm really glad not to have known until after the Olympics were over that I needed to get an MRI and that eventually turned into surgery. Gotcha. So it didn't take long for things to change for you after the Olympics. Uh, I, I had heard you say, um, and this was really, I thought this was a really important statement that, you know, the winning the medals, especially the individual medal in Vancouver had this, this enormous impact on you. Um, because it seemed like for a good portion of your sport life, you know, you were looking for a sense of validation and in that moment you you had it and it you know the i can't imagine the emotions um i'm sure it, it ran for a while but the other thing that you said that i thought was really important and interesting was that you expected that that would have this incredible like you'd never be the same right you won the lottery everything's great you know you'll never have to pay for anything and like all this stuff's gonna happen and then you had said three months later, you're back to being the same person and you still have to do stuff. So if you could talk about that a little bit, I, th I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I, um, I learned a lot from having a medal. Uh, I learned that winning medals or any form of outside achievement, that is not where good enough comes from. 
and I'm actually studying sports psychology at Adams State University this semester. And there's this thing called the inside out model of confidence. And it's the thing I wish that I had known back then. Actually, it's the thing I wish my parents and coaches had known back then because they could have taught me in a, a, a little differently. Um, so the inside out model of confidence, if we think of it like a dartboard, um, the very outside or a bullseye, you know, the very outside ring, that's your athletic performance or your ability to achieve sports, academics, theater, music, whatever. One level in from performance is confidence. So if you perform well, you're confident, makes sense. And then if you're confident, we go one ring in and that's identity. So an athlete's identity starts to get wrapped up in their ability to be confident because they can perform well. And then the very center of the bullseye is self-esteem. And so very much what had been happening to me in 2010 was that I had performance, I had confidence, I had identity wrapped up in performance and confidence, but no genuine self-esteem, no genuine ability to have positive self-talk or um, to develop close relationships with teammates or friends. I was very motivated by accomplishment. Mm. And then when I accomplished the goal and I still didn't feel good enough. And that really hurt my feelings because like, what have I been working so hard for? What have I been sacrificing so much for my whole life? Um, and it really opened my eyes to the fact that medals are just things, you know, self-esteem that doesn't come with a, a piece of paper with your name printed on it or a medal or a gold star. Self-esteem comes from your ability to feel good about yourself. And when you feel good about yourself, you can start to orient your identity around the things of yourself that you like. And then you can have confidence because you think you're a good person. And then you perform better because you're confident. Yeah. And it's amazing how that works when we look at building confidence from the very inside, starting with self-esteem and self-worth, and then building out. This idea that having good performance is where confidence comes from, it's BS. For, for the short amount of time that it works, uh, there will come a day when you realize this is just a Band-Aid. This yeah. isn't actually real. This is just using external things to fill my internal cup. Does that make sense? 100%. And I, I think you can apply that to, well, you said it already, but I think you can apply that to so many aspects of life. Um, you know, I mean, we, we measure performance, right? It's like, you know, if it's speed skating, there's a clock or you're finishing ahead of somebody, uh, you know, in, in sales, it's measured by, you know, revenue, right? So I totally yeah. got it. I, I think that's, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So I do want to shift a gear here, though, and... As, as you and I talked before, there, there's a lot of Catherine uh, podcast information out there that, that deals with, you know, mindset coaching and, and all that stuff. And it's great. And I'm glad we're talking about it because it's really important and of high interest to me personally. But I do not want to pass over the fact that you are a badass skater. And I, and it coupled with the fact that I don't know a ton about short track and I'm fascinated by it because I finally did it this summer. So I want to play a couple of clips and I want to give you the opportunity to try to explain to me what's happening. Or if you can, um, maybe you'll just say, look, everything's happening too fast. I didn't plan that pass, but I just executed it. So we can all learn together. So I, I want to start with the, the Vancouver silver medal. Um, this is the, the ladies thousand final, um, couple of Chinese girls, one who was very strong and probably the favorite you, and then a girl from South Korea. So I want to play these clips. They'll end. We'll talk a little bit and then we'll continue. Will you indulge me? Yeah, of course. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Let's get this one started here. This is, so this is the ladies final in the thousand. We'll just do the first part of this. Thank you. 
So ten and a half laps, right? Uh, nine laps. Oh, nine laps. Yeah, because it's 110 or 111 yeah. laps. Nine laps. Okay. Well, that's a bad move. <laughs> so at this point, we've gone through about half of the race. Now, my layman's view of what was happening there is it seemed like the pace was high. There was a lot of kind of jockeying around trying to figure out where you wanted to be. Um, and then shortly after that, things kind of settled down, but then we'll set up the really interesting part of the race. So, I mean, take me through those first laps. Is, is there anything specific really happening? Or, or do you go into a race like that with some kind of strategy? Or what's yeah. happening? Help me out. <laughs> so in, in 2010, racing had a little different strategy than it has now. In 2010, the thousand meter would get broken up into three sets of three. So we've got our three lap opener, uh, three laps of kind of that middle settling in time, and then three laps at the end where it's a sprint. So my goal in that race from the first three laps was to be in metal contending position um ideally we do not want the two chinese athletes skating together yep. so that was something that park soon he the korean athlete and i did really well is that park soon he went to the front which is a, not a normal place for her normally meng wang likes to lead right from the gun so the fact that park soon he went up to the front and pushed the pace not only did that help me split the chinese skaters up but it also just created um more strategy, more work for Meng Wong, which was good for me because I, I wasn't planning on being in the front that soon. I was planning on stay in metal contention, stay safe, and really my strategy was wait. It, it was just, there will be an opportunity. The thousand meter is bonkers. Everybody's trying to perform um, with everything that they have. So my, my, my strategy was to be patient. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's pick it up from here and it gets quite interesting. So obviously at this point, uh, you've, you've been passed on the inside. You're now you're in fourth and the girls are all stacked up on top of each other. So at this exact moment in time, it, did you decide, okay, I'm going wide, and then I'm going to go off the corner, and we're going to uh, we're going to go for this big pass? No, I knew <laughs> at the red line going into the corner that I was going to make a pass. As soon as Ju as soon as Joe Young went up my inside, my first thought was, I've trained for this. And I had, I had that pass down. I knew exactly what to do. I saw it coming uh, before we even got to the first block. So I was setting that pass up. That pass was already set up by the okay. time you press pause. Okay. And this, at this point in the clip, my thought process, again, back to being patient is wait. Because if you time a pass when you want it to work, it's not gonna work. <laughs> you have to wait and time your passes when there's an opening. And if there's not an opening, I understand short track is aggressive and sometimes you have to make it work, but this is a final. I can't afford a DQ. I can't afford a fall. I only have the opportunity to make a perfect pass and that's it. So my thought process at that point where we paused is hold this, hold this pivot for as long as it takes because I know the door will open up, and I've already practiced this pass. Okay, well, this is an awesome one, so let's watch it. Yeah, and I can talk you through it a little bit yeah. while we go. So here, patient, 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 patient. Okay, there it is, there's the hole. And now right away, two crossovers going into the corner. And if you are listening and you do short track, you must have a two crossover entry in your toolbox. If you don't, you are extremely limited on what you can do internationally. You're also domestically, but you'll get away with it. Domestically, you'll be able to cheat. If you want to have an opportunity to make passes, 
at an international level, you have to be able to take two crossovers into your corner. Um, and so that is like, hopefully that is the nugget that all your short track speed skaters <laughs> take away today because you can be the mentally toughest athlete there ever was. You can be strong, you can be fast. If you don't know how to use track patterns, if you don't know how to pick up and slow down your foot speed, you're going to be limited on a World Cup level. Uh, interesting. So let's uh, let's see how this turns out. So at this point, do you feel like you have any chance to get to the front? Uh, We're not there, obviously. Not there, yeah. I love this though, because we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll, I'll walk you through. I'll walk you through the end there. Yes, going into the last corner, you'll notice I do two crossovers going in. I have every intention of pulling the same pass that worked for me, you know, two or three laps before. Um, but let's be real, Meng Wang uh, is one of the winningest female short track speed skaters of all time. She might be the winningest short track really? female skater of all time. Um, and and she did a really nice job. She did what's called jamming the pack. So if we're skating along and I'm coming in close, if this athlete can feel me speeding up, they'll pump the brakes to slow me down. Yeah. So I don't know if she did that on purpose or if that's just how her track would have been anyway, but at the moment that I was working to speed up, I basically just ran into her. I don't know if she was working to slow me down. Maybe my timing was off. I mean, it's the end of a nine lap race. We were all very tired. Yeah. Um, so my setup was not as good on that corner as it had been a few corners before. Uh, that, that being said, silver medal. <laughs> well, I like this next one um, because it's also super cool. And, and it's more interesting because there's, there's three Koreans in the race. There's five people in the race. Um, so there's a lot more going on, but also there's an announcer. So now I don't have to try to say anything. So this is uh, 2011 World Championships, another um, thousand race, and this is this is some killer skating. See Cho get to the front, look back, slow down. That's absolutely done on purpose. Here comes Reuter on the inside. Doesn't want to let the get one, two, three. Now this is not a good situation. Yes. It's exactly what we were talking about. There's the maneuver, three Koreans to the front. Reuter now hanging back in fifth. But now what we're gonna see is just how strong Catherine Reuter is. Because yes, we are. So, so having three Koreans in the race probably uh, adds a little bit of extra drama, or maybe in this case, maybe it hurt them. What do you think? Um. Well, it didn't hurt them because any any time you've got two or more skaters from the same country in a race, that's helpful. It's always helpful to have teammates in the race, even if you're not team skating. You're just you're skating with people you know. Mm. It that makes it easier. Um, no, I will say that at that point in that race, again, my strategy was patience, and of course, I knew that I didn't want to be in fifth place with five laps to go but I can feel the pace of the race. And um, I remember very distinctly, again, the same thing that happened in 2010, just wait. I, I already know this pass. I've done it a thousand times, but you can't do it too early. You can only do it when it's time. So just be patient. Well, let's watch that then. Because in order to break this triumphant of three Korean skaters, you have to be strong. And here comes Reuter on the outside. Look at Reuter with a great outside move. What a phenomenal move to move to the front by Catherine Reuter. She caught them sleeping. The Koreans slowed down a little bit. They were looking back. They allowed Reuter to get to the front. Now, this race is almost over because Reuter is awfully difficult to pass when she gets in this position. Yes, she is. That was a good pass. That was, <laughs> come on. That was killer. <laughs> But it was timing. It was timing. And the announcer was right. I wouldn't... Sleeping's not the right term. It's just that before 2014, I would say, short track strategy used to be very up and down. It 
now what people do is they go to the front and they sprint and they time trial everything. And that's not how short track used to be. Short track used to be hurry up, get to the front. Okay, well, I don't wanna burn up too much energy, so now I'm gonna slow down. And that's, that's how you did it. It was smart racing. And instead of going up and just killing yourself, go hard when it's time to go hard, hmm. relax when it's time to relax. So I waited for them to go through that. It's natural. It's a natural ebb and flow. It's how racing used to go. And I was really good at feeling it. And so the, the instant that I felt them start to relax, it was the moment that I started to speed up. Yeah. Well, let's watch the, the finish. And now it breaks into that sprint. Can Catherine Reuter bring it home with a lap and a half? There's Ariana Fontana on the outside. We talked about if this race stayed slow, she had a chance, and there she is. And Reuter starting to pull a gap. Catherine Reuter with an incredible pass, trying to bring home a world championship. And the American will do it. Catherine Reuter passed three Koreans on one lap of the rink and uses that move to win a world championship. That absolutely is one of the best races I've ever seen Catherine Reuter skate. To do That's pretty good. Thanks. <laughs> so... Thank you for uh, sharing sharing the insight on that. That was that was more than I was expecting. But again, you know, my knowledge of short track is is about zero. Um, but I'm I'm way more interested in it now. Now that I've done it, and I realize just how incredibly hard it is um, from a training aspect. Um, it's killer. And now I see why skaters like Shawnee Davis never stop doing short track and. He used to always tell me, he's like, you're never going to get a better workout. Um, so from a fitness standpoint, he stuck with it simply because it was the best training. Yeah, I agree. I used to train with Shawnee on the short track. He was my teammate probably from 2005 all the way until, well, he probably started uh, specializing in long track around 2009 because mm -hmm. he would go to World Cups. I mean, he was on my first World Cup team in China, um, and he would train with us on the short track team all summer long. So it wasn't until, I remember when he stopped competing short track. I think he always trained it. Yeah. But up until about 2008, 2009, he was actively World Cup level competing short track. Yeah, he's pretty good. That's my memory. <laughs> he's all right. <laughs> so, you know, we, we already talked about the fact that you had that, that first injury at, at the moment in 2010. You didn't really know the extent of it. And then then the surgeries and, and all of this stuff started. But... Interestingly enough, the race that we just watched was in 2011. So kind of take us through how all of this sort of unfolded leading up to the, the moments in 2013 when you said, you know, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, so I had had one hip surgery at, at that point when I was at the 2011 trials. Um, if I think back... I had been unable to do any form of training other than skating and bike riding for probably two or three months at the point where I won that race. Um, and that weekend was both my highest and lowest because I, I won a world championship race. I was a world champion in the 1500. Uh, two days later, it was time for the thousand, which is traditionally my best race. I had no no reason whatsoever to believe that it was not going to be a world championship winning weekend for me. Everything was going great. And we raced the thousand meter and a Chinese athlete, I think it was Li Ru, she fell with only about a lap to go, maybe two. And I think I was in second when she fell. I was in second feeling very confident that I knew how to get up to first. So she fell down, she didn't get up. The referee called the race 
and kicked her off the ice. She tried to re-skate, and the referee said, no, 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 (laughs) that doesn't work that way. You've got to go. Um, so she got off the ice and it was Harry Cho and Ariana Fontana who skated in the reskate. And, um, again, coming around with two laps to go, I was timing a very similar pass to what had worked for me in 2010 in the thousand, except for I, I timed it too tight and I actually kicked a block. And when I kicked that block, I fell and that was the fall that ended ended Catherine Reuter. She never made it back. I was never as good after that day as I was ever before. Mm. I needed two more hip surgeries after that, um, all kinds of cortisone shots, MRIs. That was the beginning of the end. And I mean, really the fall in Marquette where I hurt my hip, that was the beginning of the end. But like I said, I, I had trained so long and so hard up to that point that even with surgeries, even with not being able to do all the things that my teammates could do, I knew how to skate. I knew how to race. I could still get on a bike. And so I was really maintaining my strength at that time. Um, And yeah, it's just interesting that you choose that clip because we're literally three days at that point, not even, I'm ranked first in the world and I'm two days away from never being that good ever again. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was a tough weekend. Yes. <laughs> so, but that was in 2011, and and so you still kept fighting all the way to 2013. Um, I did. When when you when you finally made the decision and you you know told people, hey, this is it in 2013. Was, was that an iterative process, I assume? You know, many moments where you said, I'm done, no. but then you said, no, I'm not done? Or was it just like one day you just said, holy hell, I can't do this? So after that race um, in 2011, uh, I trained that summer. I was uh, absolutely not getting another surgery. I already did that. It didn't work. My pain was not better. Um, I was hell bent against getting another surgery. And so I made it through the summer again, just skating and bike riding, almost no other training really. I would still train a lot. I just couldn't do very many things. Okay. Um, and then I got fifth place at us championships that year. And it was Anthony Labello who pulled me aside and said, what are you doing to yourself? Um, and he said like, this isn't you 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 should be winning not barely making the relay spot like you you're killing yourself what are you doing and that hurt my feelings a lot that like up until then i think i'd been convincing myself and i I can do this i'll just continue to modify and you know i just reached the day where modifying the workouts was no longer working and I made the team but i decided to forego the rest of the season i got um two hip surgeries, one in January, one in March. Uh, And again, like now here we are, we're on the decline. So after that, I was in rehab for probably a full year before I was cleared to skate again. And really sad story, I dropped all my classes and I was like, yay, I can skate. I don't need to go to school anymore. Dropped all my classes, got back to the rink, herniated a disc. And I was right back in rehab and, um, yeah, more, more cortisol or cortisone shots, I should say more Celebrex. Um, and then my grandpa passed away and I went to his funeral and my cousins didn't know my name. They just knew that I was the Olympic cousin. And that really hurt my feelings that like, I'm literally killing myself mentally, physically, socially, spiritually, emotionally. I feel dead mm. and I'm not winning, right? Like my, my, my model of confidence had completely fallen apart to the point where my family members don't even know me, but they know I was on TV, you know? Mm. And that felt so hollow and shallow that I quit. So and I think is... people think that being a medalist is like glitter and unicorns yeah. and it's not. <laughs> It's really not. It's like my body was falling apart for so many years. 
thanks be to God that I trained as hard as I did leading up to that point so that I could keep my fitness and continue to compete. But it, it wasn't fun or easy. Yeah. So when you finally made that decision, now you had to sit back and say, okay, what am I going to do now? Um, how long did it take you before you at least chose something, um, to, you know, make money and, and, and have a life you, you moved to coaching, correct? Yeah. Well, if that all happened 10 years ago, I would tell you that I'm still working on it. (laughs) I got an opportunity to move to Milwaukee and coach in 2013. And I did that for a few years, but I, I was still very personally invested. It was difficult for me to coach, feeling as though I never achieved my, my athletic potential. Um, so I told you before in 2016, my hips actually did get back to the point where I could, I could stabilize. Um, so I decided I'd skate, I'd skate again and the best case scenario is I'd make one more Olympic team. The worst case scenario was that, you know, I never did finish school so I can, I can go back. I can take some more classes. I can train on the side. And the worst case scenario is that I finish my sport on my own terms and I don't feel like it's taken from me. Um, and that's pretty much how that worked out, right? Like I came back, I I was taking classes full time. It's very interesting to me how I fell in 2000 and must have been January of 2017 and I got a concussion and again I was never the same and it was kind of a bad dream actually to to make that commitment and to go back to making that sacrifice and have yet another injury holding me back Um, and at that point that's when I decided that uh, God was giving me a practice in mindfulness and it was my job to be grateful for the moments that I had. And um, that's the only reason I made it actually to the 2018 trials every single day. Um, Probably, yeah, probably from about June when I started training again. So I was concussed from January to June. I had planned my wedding on July 1st, since we normally got to take that weekend, that like July 4th weekend off, I thought that was the perfect time for a wedding. Uh, But instead, I had actually just started training again about a week before my wedding. And then I got married. That takes a few days, right? I recovered for a few days after that. And um, here we are, it's the middle of July. Trials are in August. And you know, what am I going to do? How, how am I going to be ready? And um, I made that team again. I made a relay spot off of about six weeks of training in 2017 in the fall. I turned down my spot to compete internationally cause I, I didn't feel well. Um, and I stayed home. I tried to train and be ready for the Olympic trials and, uh, Olympic trials didn't go the way that I wanted. And I just kept on thanking God for my opportunity to practice mindfulness because there's really nothing wrong, right? Like I had to keep reminding myself, you're not, you're not dying or dead. You're just not going to have the result that you want. And it's, you're going to learn how to be okay with that. And so that was a, that was a gift, you know, coming from a background where all of my confidence, all of my self-esteem and self-worth came from winning. So being there, then coming all the way down here, I'm not winning anymore to the point where now my family members don't even know my name. Like that, that'll screw up your self-esteem when you realize how many, how your eggs have been in the wrong basket. And then I want to come back. I want to perform in a way that was, I felt was taken from me, but this time I want to do it with a, a mindset where I feel good enough. Even if I win or lose, it doesn't matter. I have relationships. You know, I have the right mindset. I have a relationship with God and it's a two way street. These are things I did not have in 2010. And even without the result that I wanted in 2018, I was a better person because of it. So when you, when you exited those trials, um, how long did it take you to decide that you wanted to actually build a business 
from the things that you had learned and the experiences that you had. And at, at that point, I think you felt like, you know, I, I can give back. I, I, I know what to do with this. Now I got to do something with it. So when was Fix Your Mindset born? Just a few months after the Olympic trials, I, I paid and purchased my own LLC in March of 2018. And now at this point, it's mostly a public speaking business where I, I work with teams as well as professional organizations about not just mental toughness, but specifically performance mindset. And I really like to use mindfulness and meditation as kind of the, the base of what it is that I teach, because I, I genuinely believe if you want to change your thoughts, first you have to slow them down so that you can observe them and decide which ones are good, which ones you want versus which ones aren't helping me anymore. And that's the mindfulness meditation process is slowing down your thoughts. And then we can decide, oh, it'd be more helpful to use a positive affirmation right here. So let me practice my affirmations. Or it might be more helpful to uh, notice the things that I did well today instead of berating myself over the things that didn't go well. Um, another common practice is just practicing gratitude, right? I can be mad at myself because I didn't hit the lap times that I wanted, or I can look around the room and find three things to be grateful for. So uh, it sounds... It, it, it sounds like this and it also is like this. It's simple, but it isn't easy to have the ability to stop and choose your thoughts. And I like to think of it like you're putting on a sweater. So sometimes even today, let's say I mess something up at work and I'm, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm mad at myself and it feels like I'm wearing a sweater that's too tight. So I take that one off and I say, well, looks like I need to get better at time management today. What can I do tomorrow? I'll, um, I'll wake up a little earlier or I'll skip the coffee break or whatever that is. But that's where that's when it becomes a skill is when you can notice I'm having an unhelpful thought, stop that thought and choose a more helpful thought instead. That's where meditation and mindfulness comes in. And once a person has the ability to do that, then we can really start to teach effective mental skills. Hmm. So how often are you speaking and, and what's the range of, of people that you might stand in front of? Are we talking businesses, schools, church groups? Uh, what, what's the, is it everything? Yes, it's all, it's all of those things. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I don't, if I were a little better business owner, I'd have an elevator speech for you. <laughs> Um, but if I can try to give you a, a short little synopsis, it's basically mental skills for high performers. And high performing can be, I want better sales. It can be, I want better grades. It can be, I wanna feel more confident. Uh, it can be really, really simple stuff. I want more meaningful relationships. That is its own type of performance. Hmm. So I, I know a lot of people who feel a little stuck and they don't necessarily know what to do about that that's where you might incorporate some mental skills. And again, that goes, I, I've worked with lawyers, I've worked in healthcare, I've worked in schools, I've worked for youth athletes as well as professional athletes. Like mental skills go everywhere. It's, you don't have to be training for an Olympic medal yeah. to need a sports psychologist. Gotcha. So you've been, you've been gracious with your time. I know that you had mentioned that you, you had a specific amount of time and we're already over that. Um, I appreciate you sharing your journey. Um, I, I think, um, you know, as, as candid as you are about the struggles that you've had and what you've learned um, is, is noble. Um, I'm not sure that everybody has that kind of confidence to just you know talk about where they've been and in the fact that you're taking that and using it to help others is awesome um i still think you're a badass skater um and and i really enjoyed you know watching those races with you and and hearing a little bit about uh how much it, it i don't know how you make all those decisions so quick thing things happen quickly out there but i really enjoyed that so Thank you for spending the time. Um, I knew you were going to be a great guest. This was an awesome, an awesome episode. Thank you for being here. 
yeah thanks for having me let's uh i'll see you at a rink sometime soon yeah exactly all right this was a great one and we are out of here 